So now, it's really my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Curly Bonds. He's our medical director, and I remember when I interviewed him, I was like, oh, we want him, he is great. And the reason he's great is because he's truly dedicated to our mission. He lives and breathes our mission. He's also sort of a scientist, practitioner type of person, so he has many connections with the universities and has helped us work on uh, projects to extend sort of effective practices in community mental health. One was with UCLA teaching clients how to talk to their doctors about their medication and manage their medication more successfully and more independently. He also is a true advocate and some examples of that is that the National Alliance on Mental Illness, we have people here that teach classes through the National Alliance on Mental Illness, honored him for his exemplary work as a psychiatrist. His, I don't think you have any a bio with his academic credentials. I'm not going to go on and on about them, I promise you. But he was a, a resident at UCLA, where he was honored as resident of the year in psychiatry. He's still a clinical professor there, and he's also a professor at Charles Drew University. And the really exciting thing that he's doing, maybe too exciting, is that he's leaving Thursday for Rwanda and Uganda. And it takes a really dedicated person. Um, those are the safest countries, or the most peaceful countries right now. And he is going to teach people about psychiatry and also to visit many of the AIDS clinics there to see what they're doing because he serves on the board of the um, AIDS Healthcare Foundation. So with further ado, here's Dr. Curly Bonds. Thank you, Gita, for that uh, generous introduction. I heard the gasp when you all heard I was going to Africa. Uh, it wasn't my first choice. I would have liked to go to Cape Town, but we have beaches in LA. So um, with that said, I want to also extend my warmest welcome to fellow members of the Legacy Society, as well as all the other families and supporters of Dee Dee Hirsch. It's great to be amongst friends, and we all do share a common cause. I will first give you a little bit more of my bio. So I was at UCLA, like Keita mentioned. While there, I worked with the consultation psychiatry team, which primarily treats medically ill individuals in the main hospital. So I was one of those folks to cross that semi-permeable barrier between the psychiatric hospital, the neuropsych institute, and the uh, medical center to see folks who were awaiting heart transplant both before and after the surgeries. So I learned a lot about the mind-body interactions, which have served me well now in my work at D.D. Hirsch, where we're beginning more and more to integrate physical health and mental health into one umbrella program where we have at one of our sites where people can come and get one-stop shopping for all their services. After I left UCLA, after spending about a decade there, I went to Charles Drew in South LA. And the mission of Drew, in case you aren't familiar with it, is very much like D.D. Hirsch's. It's to serve underserved populations. So a lot of people who are African-American, Latino, go there for services. As the chair of the program, I've worked with researchers there, and that's one of the reasons that I'm going to Africa. They have a grant to teach uh, the African Rwandan military forces. After spending about three years at Drew, the hospital closed. Some of you realized that King Hospital ran into some difficulties, and after that I went to jail for three years. <laughs> now, a caveat, I was there as a supervising psychiatrist, so um, I, I learned a lot while I was there, and that's helped me now because we realized that people don't stay incarcerated forever. Another passion of mine is that people need mental health regardless of where they are, and a lot of those folks now come to D.D. Hirsch, and we're able to give them appropriate services. So I still maintain my academic appointments, and I also have a small private practice, so I do see um, folks very much like those of you in the room who have resources for care, and one of my passions is to make sure that what people get when they come to a community clinic like D.D. Hirsch is equivalent to what they would get if they saw me in my private practice. So our talk, uh, and I do call it a talk, not a lecture, is a conversation about innovative interventions. And this is a talk that came to mind for me because I thought, you know, I've been a little bit out of the academic shadow of UCLA for a while. I still have my affiliation and I go back. Uh, but this is a talk that's meant to be accessible. So I put things at the level where I can understand them, which means that you're all going to understand them too. Uh, there might be questions. I would encourage you to hold those until the end because 
Although I tend to talk fast, if I get through everything, we will have some time for questions at the end, I promise. So I don't have any disclosures. I'm now five years sober, at least from getting any drug money. Uh, I haven't been paid by anybody to talk about any of the products or any of the services or drugs that I'll mention during this talk. So you can be sure you're getting my, unbi my biased, unbiased, uh, unpaid professional opinion. But there's one disclosure, like Keita mentioned. Like many of you, I come from a background where mental illness was in my family. I have a sister who I love, but who during her first year of college became very, very manic, and we didn't know what was happening. My parents wanted to suspect drugs or witchcraft, but it turned out that she was suffering from bipolar disorder, but she's no longer a sufferer. She's now recovered. She managed to raise a kid who's now a successful photographer, and they live in the other LA, Lower Alabama. So that's my, my only disclosure, and it, it really is the lens through which I see this work, because I think about what my sister needed and what she benefits from, and I think that everybody has the access and the right to have that access. So here's our itinerary. You've heard I'm going on a journey. I'm not going quite so far as the Starship Enterprise did, but we'll talk a little bit about psychopharmacology, and the reason for that is because it's still the mainstay of what we psychiatrists do. Sometimes I distinguish myself to a person who doesn't understand the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist in that I can write prescriptions. Of course, there's a lot more to it than that, uh, but one in five Americans takes some psychotropically active agent, and that matches the statistic that about 25% of us have a diagnosed mental health condition. So there's a huge pipeline of, of drugs, but unfortunately, only a few of them come to psychiatry. We'll talk about some of the most recent entries to the field. We'll next talk about neuromodulation. Now, that's just a fancy word for devices, and those are fairly new. When I was in medical school and residency, if you came close to touching a patient, if you weren't shaking their hand, you were probably violating some professional code. Uh, well, as you'll see in a moment, that's begun to change a little bit, and psychiatrists now have procedures, which we're excited about because procedures are what you can bill for. Unfortunately, this happened after Obamacare and Affordable Care Act, so the money won't be quite as flowing as much as some people thought, but we now have procedures that we're very excited about aside from just talking to people in ECT. Um, I'll next talk about a new emerging field of pharmacogenomics, and I'll explain what that is. And last, I'll talk about better living through technology. So fasten your seatbelts, away we go. So how many of you have taken organic chemistry? or past organic chemistry. <laughs> okay, I think I'm all right. I only see two hands, so I'm gonna proceed. Uh, the molecule that you see spinning around is actually velazodone or vibrant, and it's partnered with a newer molecule called vorivoxetine. What you'll see are the generic names to the left and the trade names to the right. So vibrant and Brintilex are the newest antidepressants. One was released, uh, vorivoxetine, in September of 2013. We've had Vibrant since 2011, that's when they got their FDA approvals, but sometimes it takes a little while for things to get from the laboratory to the patient. And the New York Times last year wrote an article that described a crisis in the psychiatric pipeline because most of our drugs that we have work the same way as the old drugs. There are about six serotonin reuptake inhibitors. You're probably familiar with them, Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Celexa, Lexapro. Um, I won't ask for a show of hands on that one, but many of you <laughs> probably know that those drugs are used so much that there have been studies of the water in cities like Los Angeles, and there are remnants of, of some of these molecules uh, because they're just so commonly prescribed. But these two are poly, poly serotonergic agents in that they don't just re-inhibit the uptake of, of serotonin, but they block certain receptors that are subtypes. Serotonin is a molecule or a neurotransmitter that's responsible for modulating mood and anxiety. And we know that if there's more of it available to bathe the nerve cells in the brain, that mood is usually improved. So we try to make it more available by recycling. But these two agents hit two subtype, sub subtypes, the 1A and 1B, that are responsible for two of the major side effects that you might have heard of about serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Those side effects are weight gain and sexual dysfunction. Now, I know we're at a lunch meal, but uh, so you've just had a very healthy salad, but in Southern California, it's a cardinal crime to cause a patient to gain 5, 10, 20 pounds. <laughs> so you don't want that, and it causes them to stop their medications. And actually, after they gain the weight, they want to feel attractive, and so if you've made them so they can't function, if they meet someone where their depression gets better, that's a problem too. So sexual dysfunction, weight gain, remember two main side effects of psychotropics, 
and these two agents are good in that they don't cause that to the same degree. Um, so vortoboxetine and dilazidone if, if you're thinking about a newer agent. So moving on to antidepressants, and again, this is a very, very rapid light, uh, at the speed of light view of these agents. I'll talk about some of the new agents in addiction psychiatry. And this is a pretty exciting time for me because now the worlds of addiction psychiatry and regular psychiatry are kind of melding. A lot of the programs out there that do substance abuse focus on pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, you need to just stop it, go cold turkey. But for a lot of people, that's not something that they can successfully do because addictions are a biological illness. People get horrible cravings. So buprenorphine is an entry into the market that's been around since 2006. If you haven't heard about it, it's probably because it's a pretty expensive drug that a lot of insurers didn't cover. I mean, there's stigma in the marketplace financially as well. But the nice thing about buprenorphine is that it's a semi-synthetic opioid that sits on the receptor but doesn't cause the euphoria that you might get, say, if you took heroin or a prescription narcotic agent. So the benefit of this is that it's better than methadone, which is the older agent, because it's safer. Uh, you may be familiar with the images of people lining up outside of the methadone clinic at 6, 7 in the morning because you have to dose it out every day because it's dangerous, people can overdose with it, and it's also abusable. So Suboxone has been a, a real lifesaver for many people who are professional because you can take it home, you can take it every day, it's sublingual, very easy to take and can actually prevent the cravings that happen when someone's trying to detox from opiates. So there are some other anti-craving agents too. I won't go into as much detail about these, uh, but Chantex, Revia, and Camperol respectively treat tobacco addiction, which is Chantex, which actually is not like a lot of older nicotine products. We used to give patches and gums, but those things all contain nicotine. And we're trying to get people to not use nicotine. So it's counterintuitive that you would give them something that you don't want them to have. So Chantex works by blocking the nicotine receptor. So if someone smokes, they don't get uh, the enthusiasm that they normally would have from their early smoke in the morning. Uh, Revia and Camperol both work for alcohol withdrawal and alcohol cravings, and they're very successful in helping people eliminate alcohol use. And they're not subversive, older agents to treat alcohol cravings or things like antabuse, where you get sick and you throw up if you drink while you're taking it. And so people get smart and they don't want to throw up and they just don't drink, uh, or they just don't take their medication and then they can go out and drink. So with Camprosate, it lasts for longer, so you don't have that problem. So, on to neuromodulation. Everybody still with me? Uh, so transcranial magnetic stimulation. You'll sometimes hear this referred to as RTMS, or repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. And the company that makes it is Neurostar. Um, and they're actually supporters of Alive and Running because they would like to have this available for us. But the device that you're gonna see in a moment is, is very expensive. It's a chair that allows a treatment that's sort of the new version of ECT. Just like buprenorphine is the new methadone, TMS is the new ECT. We think about ECT as being a very effective treatment, but it's scary. It involves electricity and seizures. And it's like, doctor, I wanna get well. I, I don't wanna die. So people are very afraid of ECT, even though it works well. So the Neurostar device, I'm gonna let them tell you about it from one of their videos that you can actually download for yourself on YouTube. Neuronetics has developed the Neurostar TMS therapy system as a therapy for major depression. The Neurostar system consists of power electronics, a touchscreen control panel, an electromagnetic coil, a single-use treatment link that is positioned between the coil and the patient's scalp, and a treatment chair with integrated head support. The Neurostar TMS system is prescribed for use by a trained psychiatrist. A typical acute course of therapy with the Neurostar system involves 20 to 30 outpatient treatment sessions and spans four to six weeks. Each session includes the delivery of 3,000 pulses and requires 37 minutes to complete. The patient is awake and alert during the procedure. No anesthesia or sedation is required. Upon completion of the session, the patient can immediately resume normal activities. To begin use of the Neurostar TMS system, treatment location and treatment level are determined by locating the patient's motor cortex and defining the motor threshold. The motor cortex is located by energizing the coil with single pulses as the coil is moved over the motor cortex region. 
The coil is positioned over the area that produces a visually identifiable movement of the right thumb when stimulated. Motor threshold is the minimum stimulator setting required to activate the region of the motor cortex that controls the right thumb. Treatment power is then based on the observed motor threshold. The location of treatment is also determined relative to the motor cortex. To begin treatment, the coil is moved 5 cm anterior from the motor threshold location along a parasagittal line. This positions the coil over the left prefrontal cortex. The treatment can then be started. The Neurostar TMS system delivers a sequence of 3,000 pulses during a treatment session. The system presents a summary of the completed session for the operator's review. The patient is awake and alert and can immediately return to work or other activities upon completion of the procedure. You get the general idea that this is something that a person can sit down, have a treatment that lasts about 30 minutes, the doctor can adjust the uh, intensity and the voltage and the frequency of the pulses, and you can get up and return to work right after this. People get a series of treatments, and it's really designed now for treatment refractory depression. And I've had a few people who, this has been a life changer for them, because they didn't respond to medications or for whatever reason didn't want to take them, and this treatment is very effective. So the other device that we now have access to is the vagal nerve stimulator, sometimes abbreviated the VNS. It's made by a company called Cybernics, and this one is FDA approved for chronic recurrent depression that's not responsive to usable treatment as well. Was originally approved in 1997 for epilepsy, so psychiatry and neurology are closely linked. We borrowed from their page because we learned that some people with epilepsy also have depression. It's about 30 percent, and their depressions got better. So it was used then to treat depression in isolation, and it can be combined with other treatments including medications or ECT or now even VNS. So for someone who truly doesn't respond to medications, this is an option. You can also combine the transcranial magnetic stimulation with medications as well. So this just shows you what the device looks like. It's about the size of a pacemaker, goes into the anterior chest wall, just like a pacemaker would. Now this is something that a psychiatrist isn't doing in their office because it involves blood and we don't do that. Uh, so we send them out to a surgeon, they get the device installed, and then they come back to us and this is what it looks like in the neck. Uh, the vagal nerve is really a large nerve that we found is a very good way to communicate between the body and the brain. You have one on each side of, of the chest, and it also innervates the diaphragm. But it delivers this device a mild intermittent pulse signal to the vagus nerve, which then transmits to the brain that causes neuromodulation to occur. Some of those neurotransmitters that I mentioned before, like serotonin, norepinephrine, get released as a result of these pulses and the result is that the patient feels and gets better. So this shows the patient with the wand that they hold over this device while the physician pulls this agent that looks sort of like a Palm Pilot, can adjust it, and I imagine at this point they have an iPhone app for it, but you can do this in the office depending on how the patient reports their mood, so that this is actually something that is a new alternative for depression. Hasn't caught on quite as much as TMS, again because it's invasive and does require the creation of a wound. So the next stop on our journey is pharmacogenomics, which I mentioned I would explain. Assurix is a company that makes a product called GeneSight, and some of you may have heard about the Human Genome Project, where we're trying to code, or we did code, the entire human genome, and you're wondering, how does this affect me, because our tax dollars paid for it? Well, one of the benefits has been that we now can look at how the body affects medications, in other words, pharmacodynamics, what happens after I take a drug. You know that some people are lightweight, so you can have one glass of iced tea and you're wired. Some people need to have five glasses before they get to that point. The same thing is true with medications. We all metabolize them slightly differently. And so this is a test that your doctor can administer and tell you which drugs you're more likely to have side effects from because of how your body will metabolize them. So this is the swab that comes. It's in a little FedEx envelope and you actually rub on the inside of the cheek, the buccal membrane a bit, 10 seconds on each side. They get shipped off to the lab, and about two weeks later, the doctor will get a report that comes to their email that looks like this. And if you were to walk through it, the drugs that show up in the green column mean you're good to go. These are medications that you metabolize normally, shouldn't have any side effects, and they should be effective. 
Medications in the yellow are ones that your body might have trouble with. So these are the folks who might potentially respond differently or might have need a lower dose or they may um, have side effects from them. And then of course the red column are the ones that we really need to worry about and monitor you carefully and maybe avoid altogether because you're a slow metabolizer. These are all done through what's called the P450 system. Everybody say that, P450 system. Great, you're learning. Uh, so that's in your liver and is what re is responsible for metabolizing all of these medications. So there's a whole host of P450 enzymes that are beyond the scope of this talk, but just be aware that now you can go to your doctor and say, I want the pharmacogenomic test. This is offered for antidepressants, for antipsychotics, and for attention deficit disorder medications. There's also one that's for psycho-oncology or oncology medications as well. So we move into the last leg of our journey, and this is better living through technology. I sometimes get accused of having an app for everything, and this is, uh, of course, a mock-up of a blood pressure and checking the smartphone uh, to use, because we like to monitor everything and we like to be in touch with the world around us. We like to get restaurant reviews on our phones. We like to get information about the environment. And we can also get information about ourselves and record things like how many steps we take or how many calories we intake. Well, why not use it to improve health? And there's a, a project that I've been working with that is now in the, I would say, pilot stage where we are seeking funding. Karen Chang, myself, are both faculty members at Charles Drew, but she also has a concurrent faculty appointment at UC Irvine, and she recruited some very enthusiastic, very bright, very nerdy undergraduate students who had a summer project request, and she said, well, I have this great app to treat um, maternal fetal bonding for women who have high-risk babies, and it was something where they could monitor like how often the baby was feeding, whether it was wetting, crying, but she thought, we can apply this in mental health, and she asked me, which of our populations at D.D. Hirsch are the most difficult for us to engage? And it turns out it's those 16 to 25 year olds, so-called transitional age youth, that really are not so interested in talking to a person, but they'll put anything on Facebook or social media um, or on their cell phone. And so we are going to seek funding and we've gotten a preliminary score that's favorable, but I'll introduce you to this notion that at the very bottom of this pyramid of self-care um, or medical in cost is self-care. You know, if we can get people to really take responsibility for monitoring themselves and, and doing the right things like eating right, exercising, taking their medications, going to the doctor, the things at the higher end of this pyramid, which are long-term hospitalization, physician appointments, surgical intervention, the base of it is really taking care of yourself. So we want to have that base be really, really well covered. So this is an initial prototype and it shows uh, what this app would look like on your phone. It includes everything from appointment reminders, medication log reminders, ability to self-monitor your mood, a depression survey, most motivational messages. So some of you are here because you know about our suicide prevention center. Well, just imagine that someone who's maybe having several days in a row where they're feeling down, maybe they get to a point where their score is so low that they feel depressed. They would get a text message that might be anywhere from telling them, hey, this is something that you said that would help you. You can go for a walk, you can take a hot bath. But if it gets to something that's more serious, like a person who's truly beginning to have thoughts of suicide, the number for our suicide prevention center would pop up along with um, the number for their crisis hotline to let them know that there's help just a, a phone call away. So this monitoring would happen both between appointments so that when some go, someone goes in to see the physician or the nurse, they can look at all of this data that's been collected because I don't know about you, but sometimes when I walk into a doctor's office, I know he only has 10 minutes and I need to get it all out. Well, if he has this information beforehand, it really might be helpful. So these are more screens that just show you can put in appointment reminders, uh, phone numbers, if you need to cancel or confirm. This can all be done through the interaction of this uh, application and it's for either iPhone or Android. You can monitor your moods. There are visual scales, similar to the pain scale that you probably had if you ever had an inpatient surgery. Update your mood. Some people, you know, it's just a finger slide where you tell how you're doing. And then this printout on the right is just a chart that the doctor would see so that between appointments we can see if you've had a low mood most days or a high mood. And again, be able to incorporate that into your treatment plan as to whether we're going to adjust your medication because there is something called state-dependent memory, where if I had a bad drive or a bad bus ride to the, the office, I might be in a bad mood. And I don't want my decision about your treatment for the next month or three months to be dependent on the fact that you had a bad day. Uh, we want to look at cumulative data over time. 
And last but not least, being able to manage the medications is very important. If you can record which medications I've taken, I'll be able to know how compliant or how adherent you were with the, the treatment and whether or not it's working because you didn't take it or because it's just not working. And of course, we would give points for all these things in the app. There's something called the gamification okay. of life, where a lot of people really respond well if they can get points. Uh, it makes people do all kinds of crazy things, like go 10,000 steps a day, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> so I happen to think that the brain is the final frontier for medicine. Uh, I'm a real Trekkie and was a geek as a kid, and one of my idols was Bones McCoy, who's in this bottom right corner. And I think we're not quite at the point yet where we have the tricorder scanner where we can both transport ourselves and figure out what's going on inside of someone's body or brain. Uh, but I think that there might be a time when, when we'll get there. So as I promised, we're now at the end, and I'm happy to take any questions about this. Yes. If I were to see a psychiatrist in Los Angeles, how likely is he or she to be able to prescribe these treatments? Uh, the question was, how likely is a psychiatrist in Los Angeles to be able to prescribe these treatments? Well, that's a very interesting question because it's probably going to depend on two things. Your wallet biopsy and your zip code. Uh, by that I mean these re treatments, for example, the TMS chair costs about $8,000. And each application of the filter that you saw in the video costs about $100. So this is not yet covered by Medicaid or Medicare um, or Medi-Cal. But some of the other treatments, like the drugs, for example, are all covered. The pharmacogenomic profile is covered by Medicare, but not by Medi-Cal yet. So if the psychiatrist is knowledgeable about these things, it's going to depend on what your insurance coverage is or your out-of-pocket ability to pay. There are other things like this app, which you couldn't get yet because it's not. But for the most part, all these things, if you have the right resources, you could get tomorrow. And that was a part of the focus of this talk. Could you talk about DBS? Deep brain stimulation. Deep brain stimulation is similar to vagal nerve stimulation. I would say that in terms of my experience with it, it's a bit riskier because it does require the insertion of a probe, so there's risk of infection. I don't know the literature really well with it, but I think it's equally effective to the other, pre the other presented interventions like vagal nerve stimulation and T TMS. I don't know the outcome in terms of how well it's been adapted because people are kind of fearful. So I think it's still after you've tried these other two less invasive things, which, which you might go to. Yes. Me? Yes. Oh, if, um, let's say your psychologist isn't aware of this, is there a place I could send them to say, you know, here's to go, here's to, you know, to check it all out, learn all you can, or they're continuing education courses on it, or how do they learn? That's a good question. I guess I sort of, a lot of these things, if you're aware of them, there are, a lot of these things are made by companies that promote them. So there are, you know, the internet is the greatest resource. I don't know that there's a single one clearinghouse. There are a few websites like Medscape that's more targeted towards professionals. So I'm not sure, I think that... Medscape? Medscape. Okay. Um, and the NAMI website actually has a lot of resources about local interventions, has a lot of information about the newest medications. And in fact, a lot of times when I'm with someone who wants information about a medication, I'll refer them to the NAMI website, and sometimes in the office we'll just print out the list of, of side effects and indications for the med. Yes? Uh, I've read that some medications uh, can make cause or do cause thoughts of suicide. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. That's an excellent point. Many medications, especially the antidepressants, can cause thoughts of suicide. We don't fully understand serotonin and its ramifications, but we do know that people who die by suicide typically have changes in their serotonin levels in their bloodstream and their central nervous system. For reasons that we don't fully understand, for some people, especially young adults, it's the biggest risk for kids that when they take an antidepressant, they may begin to develop feelings or urges to attempt suicide. The truth is that it's rare for anyone to die by suicide as a result of a medication side effect, but there are more attempts. And that is something that is now a black box warning so that whenever a physician prescribes these agents, especially to a young adult, we are obligated to warn them that should they have those thoughts, they need to contact us right away. It is considered an emergency. Yes. I thought your presentation was wonderful, but all those big words came by very quickly. Is there a way that we can get a copy of this slideshow? Absolutely. I'll make a copy available uh, through Joel, and he certainly will have it. And I think that this presentation was being captured, so it may be available at some point. 
on the Deepers um, internet presence. It was presented very clearly. I do. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Where do you start if you want to have the DNA study to match the medications to your loved one? The DNA try to study the, the pharmacogenomic test. Yes. I would say that the company that makes it, Assurex, is, I mean, they do a lot of marketing. It's fairly new. They have representatives so that a doctor has to go online to register, but they're the only people that I know right now who promote it and who make it available. And fortunately, they do have a patient assistance program to where, depending on your income, you can pay as little as $20 to get this test if your insurance doesn't cover it, or if your insurance only covers a part of it. So uh, Assurex is the name of the company, and GeneSight is the name of the, the product. What do you think of hypnotherapy? Hypnotherapy, certainly not the newest technology, but I'm a big fan. I do know that at UCLA they have a mind-body clinic that's formerly run by Dr. Rapke, who used hypnotherapy and who used meditation and mindfulness. All of those interventions are, I would say, low-tech, but very effective in terms of the people who are suggestible. There are certain tests that you can do by looking at eyelid, flag, to determine if someone's likely to be hypnotizable, but it can be used for anything from relaxation, changing habits like smoking or overeating. It can also be very helpful for some people in things as extreme as childbirth, where they can go through it if you're very, very suggestible. But I would say that it's a, it's a complementary or alternative technique. Usually, I would recommend it in combination with something else. Any other questions? I want to thank you all very, very much. You've been a wonderful audience, and I hope that uh, you